In a recent IPSA seminar, Steve gave an explication of the five-stage confirmation model of lifespan development. That being confirmation by the mother, then by the father, then by a peer group, then by a life partner, before finally self-confirmation. We thought you guys would enjoy hearing this, so you can apply it to your own life for the purposes of discovering your own personal myth. If you'd like to read more, make sure you pick up a copy of our personal myth guide, link in the description, and if you'd like to one day join us for our IPSA seminars, like the one this clip was taken from, for the purposes of training to become a clinician, then check out the application process, again through the link in the description. Let's get into it. personal myth is the unconscious narrative of our life which refers back to the evolution of our self-concept through our development and around that of course gathers the complexes as we were saying earlier uh, and every trial and tribulation and stage of adaptation in our life but it's tacit because although we're aware of it and we can remember chunks of it we seldom look at the through line which is the organizing axis around which everything gathers and then we kind of find ourselves in a state and not understand how we got where we are. The process of understanding how we got where we are leads to the equation. That is to say what adds up literally to us being us. So the personal equation is the result of analysing, self-analysing our personal myth. And the myth is a good and a bad thing because and too many people treat it as just being good. It's bad because it, it describes the complexes that we've identified with. It uncovers our traumas all of our maladaptations, that's the darker side of it. So we need to understand those as well as the more sort of Jungian and pop psychology idea of a myth as being something wonderful. It's, all, it's also something unpleasant for many of us, perhaps all of us, at least some of the time. But when we do assimilate that, then we do have our place to stand and we can say, okay, now I know more or less who I am up to now in my life. I know how I've gotten to be here I have my place to stand. That's your personal equation. Once you've got that, you can authentically individuate in a Jungian sense of meaning of consciously developing your latent potential in the future. So the, uh, the personal equation is both a place to stand and a place to step off from into the future, having addressed your life thus far and integrated it consciously. I think it was, when were we like, was it Sunday? Oh no, yesterday. I think we, we were discussing with Carla Free about, um, I think it was raised that it, it can't be that simple. It can't be that linear of saying that you, you know, you, it's your mother, then it's your father, then it's your family. Oh, yes, sure. yeah. um, and mm. the idea of mentorship came up, which I, I was very grateful for. And I explained that I deliberately left mentorship out of that. And I explained why. And I, I'll go over that in a moment. I think it might be useful to do so. Well, it, it, it is not linear in every case, but it is linear in most cases. So therefore, it forms a kind of expectation which we can say that our genome expects, literally expects that we will have a female caregiver who will nurture and develop us uh, and that we are primed to imprint onto that person for immediate safety, security, nutrition and so forth. But beyond that, there is the relating factor a relating function to do with not only how we relate to the world but more importantly how we develop our identity as being a human being that is worth relating to and because the the conscious personality in Jungian terms it grows out of a sense of being unconscious and purely instinctive according to Jung and I know that the neuropsychoanalysts would disagree in the sense that they regard instincts as being conscious but in that normal sense usual sense of the idea of becoming conscious we do so in relationship to our primary caregiver that would mean that whether we were male or female in biological uh, sex terms we form our sense of self out of relationship to our primary caregiver which means therefore internally 
our sense of self at this stage is internal. The, the, the primary social relationship is to, is to the caregiver, the mother, usually. But I'm going to stick with statistically normal or average um, terms just to illustrate the path. Now, the origin of this is going to be Paleolithic. It's going to be Old Stone Age. It's going to be way, way back to when uh, reproductive groups were small. They weren't much bigger than two or three families, perhaps a little larger, uh, in a sustenance economy based on hunting and gathering. So there were very clear demarked roles, and this has been embedded, imprinted into the genome through instinct. And so that expectation is there regardless of how culture may have changed since then. So we learn about ourselves on the inside and we generate that inner image in relation primarily to the mother or mother figure, mother substitute, how we want to frame that. The father's role in a Paleolithic sense comes at the edge of the family and with the wider world. And by metaphor, we could say at the mouth of the cave, the cave environment, the Stone Age environment. What's out there that's dangerous? Well, there are predatory animals. There may be other human groups. Um, there's the whole environment which is dangerous. The father should prepare in a Paleolithic old Stone Age sense his offspring for engaging with the outer world in the same way that the mother should have prepared the child, male or female, to understand themselves on the inside. Now, it, it, it separates a little because the relationship between a daughter and a father is different than between a son and a father. And the relationship between a daughter and a mother and a son and a mother are different again. There's a lot, a lot of overlap, but there are slight differences, which I think you're aware of from the things we've discussed in the past. But principally then, even now, we learn our sense of self and identity and value as a human being from our primary maternal caregiver. Then we learn about the world primarily by how our father relates to the world. And there are confirmations to do with both. The mother confirms us with love and attention and their affection and social interaction to say you are worth bringing into existence and you have dreams, you have ideas, you have emotions and she nurtures the reception of those consciously and the understanding of them. Out from that is the beginning of our self-concept. <clears throat> and the father introduces you to the world and says it's dangerous but you're like me or you're not, you're, you're like your mother and I confirm you if you're a girl being like your mother, you're going to be like her. Your mother's taught you that you are like her. I confirm that and I introduce you to the outside world and I help you to be safe against predators, whether they're other men or, or whether they're wild animals or it's a dangerous environment. That's the role of the father to do that. And that's the laying down of uh, the complex that Jung talked about as being the animus complex for a woman. Uh, and of course, in, in, in terms of the son, it's different in relationships to the father. The mother's already laid down the idea of the anima complex. Both of them we call the relating function, relating system, because it's broader than just that. It evolves to be broader than just that. And the anticipation genetically is that it's broader than just that. So those are your two stages of confirmation. Now, in many cultures, the father hands over his son and very often his daughter, though sometimes the mother does this, um, to a mentor. They take them as far as they can go themselves, and then it's like, I can't do any more for you because I have a certain limited bandwidth of relating. I pass you on to someone who will give you special skills. And in medieval Europe, that, for example, could have been a knight. You become a squire. You're handed over to, to be trained to be a knight, trained to be a warrior, or to the church, and you, you're trained to be a priest, that kind of thing. There, there, there's that kind of mentorship. But there are other mentors. There are teachers uh, and parental substitutes. And the reason I leave this out is that it's uber uh, problematical in our culture at the moment because the mentors are, are digital, largely. They're on the internet and the people who you probably wouldn't hand your child over to, to you know, if you were really careful and conscious about how you, how you would go about this, you wouldn't give them to some of these celebrity psychologists or internet gurus because they are a mess. And what are they going to gift to your child but a mess? Now, they're, they're, they're working, if you are like, operating within an ecology, which is a mess. Our culture is in a catabolic state of decline and disruption. And these pseudo gurus are operating parasite-like on these people who have no mentorship role left for them. So I'll leave it out because it will generate too much, too much flack, too much noise. 
and there are ways around that. So I generally leave that out, out of consideration, but it is a factor. When the, the, the child is, is handed over to the peer group by his father, if it's, for example, talking about a boy, then in effect, he says, you will be like me, but not yet. And you have to go through a process of social learning and being accepted by the group and by the tribe and by peers who will be a man like you one day. They will be your peers. That's the future. So you go out and learn. And then, of course, the child hits adolescence and there's an element of competition with his peers, rivalry, as well as a collegiate spirit, which makes him bond to his group. And then he'll meet girls who have been similarly channeled and entrained on the basis of instinct by the mother and sometimes by the father to prepare to meet young men and then produce the next generation. And there are confirmation stages uh, and competition that, that goes on all the way through. Sometimes peer groups can act as mentors as well. You get this in the military very much. Uh, we're we're you know, a group of men and, and, and more, uh, more so these days to include a group of women will bond together in a collegiate sense and help to resolve things that went before that didn't work out. So you do get a lot of young men who go into the army uh, because of difficulties with their parents. My own father went into the Navy in 1933 uh, to get away from his his nuclear family and he found a family in the military in the navy and that sort of for him helped to uh, correct for what had gone wrong for him up to that point that still happens it's not just the military it, it's, it's other places so you can get a peer group confirmation final stage i, I generally ask people to consider is self-confirmation which follows on from the confirmation of you as uh, a breeding partner and i'm sorry to use the term but i'm, I'm thinking of instincts here and i discussed in, in the other um the other seminars uh, about why that is important even with people who for example might be gay or have a different sexual lifestyle or preference the instincts are still present in them and they still push i frequently even now work with gays of both sexes who wonder whether they are really gay because they want to have children and not just adopt them, they want to biologically have children. That's normal, it's human, it's perfectly acceptable and understandable and it's something we should acknowledge and recognise because it comes from instinct, they can't help it. People aren't just their sexual orientation and far more than that, that's relatively superficial. And instincts don't particularly care, they'll push. But that aside then, when you get confirmation from someone in a, a, a heterostatistically normal situation, a woman will might pick a man and say, I want to breed with you. I choose you and nobody else. I'm breeding with you. That's confirmation. That's confirmation of your genome at that level. And then what can follow that will be a Jungian level of individuation, that is to say self-confirmation, which has to build on the past with respect to whatever has been achieved or not achieved. And at each stage, there's an opportunity to cure the past. If we've had a bad mother, the father can compensate for that. If we've had a bad mother and or father, the peer group can compensate for that. If all three of them have gone wrong, the life partner can compensate for that. If all of them go wrong, individuation can compensate for that. That's if we think of it as a linear path. But of course, it's not linear. You can cycle back. You can go back. There are plenty of people who go back and source out a relationship to their father. Uh, when the father's old and they're middle-aged and they go back and they sort it out. So there's so many different ways of this working through, but we have to see what is the anticipated biological through line first, because that's what the genome expects. That's what your instincts expect. And when instincts are frustrated, they generate complexes because there's a mismatch between what they push you to achieve or to experience and what the environment has offered as an opportunity or a resolution to those expectations. And that's what we deal with as therapists basically is what the instincts want and what the environment has produced. And we're in the middle of that, that pressure from without and from within. To understand how this was intended biologically to unfold, we need to look at the genomic elements of timed release maturation across lifespan development. Uh, and that includes, of course, the emergence of personal psychology and adaptation. So pretty much that's why, we, and I'm saying it's simple, it doesn't sound it, I know, but it is, it is. If you look at the diagrams, the schematic representation, it's basically very simple. The complexity quite literally arises out of complexes which filter and distort our perceptions and understanding of our experiences. Uh, 
and get in the way of the expression of instincts. If you're looking to take your study of depth psychology and personal development to the next level using Steve and Pauline's 40 year long clinical experience as your personal guide, then make sure you check out Young to Live By's flagship offering, Discover Your Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook. For anyone who has a calling deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.